Okay. Hello. Hello, students. Hello. Greetings from American Institute of Architects. Um, we're representing a group of designers in Hong Kong, and we are trained and li <coughs> licenses in US. And very happy to have you to join us tonight for this, uh, for this evening sessions with the following speakers, uh, Su Chen, Dennis, and Joyce Lee Lam. Um, hopefully you will have a first-hand stories about the path to become an architect. Uh, tonight's sessions will be conducted into two parts. Uh, the first part will be the sharing, the sharing sessions by uh, our speakers. And the second part will be general, uh, I will be giving a general introduction about the Cabrera Court and the path to US licensures. Um, before introductions of our tonight's speakers, uh, let me just take a few minutes um, to introduce AIA Hong Kong chapters to you. Okay. So here's AIA Hong Kong. And it was, AIA was found back in 1857. And currently we have over uh, 95,000 members across the world and over 200 chapters around the world. And in, in Hong Kong, AIA Hong Kong, um, it was established back in 1997. And the objective of this chapter is to uphold the quality of design sustainability education and professional practice. And, and Hong Kong is the only location in Asia to offer the architect registration examination. And this is our theme for 2021, is serve and inspire, to serve with a community of experts and to inspire a new generation of citizen architects. And here's our EXCO members of 2021 and our president Winston Yao and our vice president Florence Chen and, um, and the 2021 committee chairs. And this year's um, YAG, this would be the, the very first event uh, uh, by YAG Young, <coughs> Young Architects Group. Um, so it's about the path to licensures and there are more to come, um, more events are planning uh, along the way and stay tuned. And here's some of the um, social medias you can follow our latest information. You, you will find the latest uh, events and information from Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and LinkedIn. So join us today. So, <clears throat> so tonight, so um, it's actually, so tonight we have uh, three speakers. Uh, to sharing the experience and the path to become architect. So the first speaker is Su Chen. Su Chen is an architect, uh, also a writer and a curator, and currently teaching architecture design at University of Hong Kong. Um, Chen, Su Chen has studied uh, many places um, <clears throat> and got the master in architecture in Harvard US GSD, and also studied previously in Peking University and Europe as well. And he's now the professors and uh, of <coughs> architecture. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, he's also the co-chair of AIA Hong Kong chapters program committees as well. And Dennis, uh, Dennis is a founder of Hong Kong, uh, is a founder of uh, Studio Right and is a registered architect and previously trained in MIT and University of Hong Kong as well. So before he started his own, pri uh, his own practice, uh, he also worked a lot uh, a renowned office in Japan, China, and Italy as well. And also has taught in uh, U of T, I'm sorry, University of Hong Kong and Hong Kong Design Institute. And lastly, uh, Joe Slee. Joe Slee currently practices at BXA Studio in New York and previously studied in Chinese University of Hong Kong and also got, his, got her master's degree in University of Pennsylvania. So um, she is very experienced uh, architecture designers and I previously have interned in Eisenman Architects in New York and Shagurun Bound Architects in Tokyo. So without further ado, I will uh, let Su Chen to begin. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for the introduction and for uh, all the efforts you put into this event. Um, I'm gonna 
Let me go to the next slide. I'm gonna very briefly reflect on my own experience um, over the past couple of years. And I look forward to the discussion later with um, Dennis, Josely, and our audience as well. Um, if you go to the next slide. So I think for me, one of the greatest curiosity during my undergraduate years was to know and understand how other design professions work. Um, especially those that are very close to us, like landscape architects, urban designers, and planners. So when I was thinking of where to go for graduate studies, I was attracted to the, you know, the, um, the melting pot nature of Harvard uh, Graduate School of Design. And later I realized that I was um, not only interested in, I was not really interested in getting into the other discipline, but more to understand the limits of our own as architects. So um, I know before going into graduate school, there was always a myth um, for me and for you know friends or architects around me to believe that we could do almost everything um, as architects. Um, and I think it's humbling to study and work along with students um, from other disciplines and to appreciate their knowledge and to collaborate with them. And sometimes, you know, I was almost all of the time we might disagree with each other. And if you go to the next slide. Um, so when I finished school, I first worked with uh, Michael Mosen, an architect in Los Angeles. And later I worked with uh, Wei Zhen Wang in Hong Kong. And I was, I think I was lucky to be exposed to projects of all sort of scales and with very different um, nature in terms of their um, programmatic or um, typologies. And for me, working from exhibitions, houses, to you know, student dormitories, eventually to urban planning and landscape design, it made me realize that the previous knowledge and experience I accumulated um, from working and studying with designers of different backgrounds um, become very valuable. And I was also at this time, you know, took exam and received my license as an architect. So if you go to the next slide, um, now I'm teaching design studio at HKU as well. Um, well, continue to practice uh, as an architect. And I realized that it is um, really meaningful to really consider what it means to practice uh, today. And that is, I'm always excited to join you know, events like this organized by AIA and then encourage my friends and students to also get their license. Because I think um, as a practicing architect, you come up against limits that you do not really come up against as uh, in academia. And these limits are really productive in helping us to frame a lot of the questions that we are facing today. And I think, uh, so that really tried to also help me think between architect as you know, a profession that serve to, and also an architect as a citizen that's part of the greater society. And for the uh, next, li next slide. So I think we are, uh, you know, thinking that we are in a world that's really increasingly concealed and confined, you know, physically, socially, and politically. And I think our profession is getting even more, you know, professionalized and segmented and compartmentalized. Last week, I was actually uh, on a call with a facade consultant for the project. And he told me he was trained as an architect, but he, will, he only draw the details of stone facade these days and not even with you know metal or glasses he only look at the stones and how the stone joined and it really you know astonished me to know to really see that compartmentalize of professional knowledge some would call it professionalization but i really think that's really just really um segmented and i think that um that's only efficient in terms of capital but i think it contributes nothing um in terms of the wealth to our society. And I think in the, all the challenges we're facing today, you know, be it climate change or social justice require designs that break the boundaries of all these limits and compartmentalized knowledge. I think as architect today, um, to practice doesn't mean, doesn't only mean to sit in front of your um, computer and be on one software all the time, but really to think beyond the, the boundary of our work and to work at many times and in many things at the same time. Yeah, I think that also 
help us to know the limits of ourselves and to extend our capacity as um, architects in the society. So that's um, my, something I learned from my experience in graduate school and also something I learned from working alongside other architects when I started my, since I started my practice. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Su Chen. Uh, it's very inspiring. Um, okay, we go to the next, uh, uh, next speakers, Dennis Chang. Yeah, Dennis. Hi, everybody. Um, so I went to MIT and before that, uh, I went to Hong Kong U and um, next slide. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, benefit that I got and um, hopefully the, uh, the, 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 the best merits that I liked from uh, studying in MIT was that uh, we got a lot of resource, um, maybe perhaps compared to a lot of other schools. Um, if you talk about scholarship, um, if you talk about funding, um, MIT actually has um, quite a lot to offer. And because of the small class um, ratio, the, the teacher to student ratio, you actually get a lot of attention and uh, it's a very small community. Uh, the school is very small, but then you get a lot of uh, chances to work with a lot of different people because uh, just because people are closer together. Um, so uh, at that time when I was doing my master, it was um, three and a half years um, master program. Uh, we went to many different places, um, including um, Venice twice uh, for free, uh, Copenhagen for free. We went to um, uh, Montreal, we went to different cities in the States as well. Um, all these uh, trips were for um, working on projects, specific projects that uh, is in collaboration with uh, the government or in different institutions. So basically you spend uh, time working with uh, the locals and then knowing the problems and then trying to tackle uh, solving it um, and then propose uh, your design. So I think um, in terms of uh, how I see uh, MIT, it was quite resourceful. Um, um, I was able to get a lot of um, uh, good exposure um, internationally uh, at different locations, different cities. Um, yeah, so next please. And um, every time when we were working uh, on projects, uh, we were very hands-on. So the MIT uh, type of uh, education is to get, you, uh, get your hands dirty. Um, so we always make prototypes. Uh, that was the, um, one of the main uh, theme among all the studios and all the classes. We make things uh, in one-to-one -one scale. Uh, so this was one uh, prototype um, and, and also the final installation for, for one event. Uh, we learned a lot of uh, structure, we learned of um, grasshopper, a lot of different things. Um, so structurally and also uh, mathematically how you can adapt and then execute in a design through fabrication. That was one of the uh, main characteristic uh, for uh, any kind of projects, um, be that in design studios, be that in buildings technology, uh, or even history class. Um, we, we all get all, we always get all the classes together and execute it. So that was um, also one theme. Um, next please. And because um, of the hands-on culture, um, there were a lot of fabrication classes offered. So when, when I was doing my master studies, I actually had all my classes uh, um, picked related to fabrication. So that was one class uh, working with soft wood, any kind of soft wood, pine, cedar, um, different type of soft wood. And um, it was a collaboration project. So you work with in teams and then um, understanding how the nature, uh, the natural materials behaves. And we try to uh, push the boundary and making it into a double curvature uh, lamination, which was um, kind of uh, an experiment that uh, stopped uh, when Eames uh, tried to do the, uh, uh, the plywood chairs that, that they experiment. Uh, they were 
generally mostly in single curvature, uh, maybe a little bit in uh, another direction. Um, so uh, if you go to the next one. So I think my uh, takeaway from MIT is that um, everything when you design should be uh, practical and should be able to execute. And if you want to validate your design, it has to be uh, working within the material realm. So um, fabrication technique is one thing, technology is one thing, um, coming to design through computation is another thing. Um, all these things uh, as the puzzles comes together. Uh, when we were studying at MIT, a lot of the classes were uh, cross-discipline. So uh, we had students uh, coming from the business school, um, students coming from the engineering school, uh, computation science. Um, so you see a lot of uh, different disciplines, uh, not just urban uh, um, urban design, city planning, or landscape design, uh, those uh, disciplines that are within uh, the School of Architecture, you see a lot of um, other people as well. And everyone um, at MIT were trying to solve problems, um, trying to make the world a better place to live in. So this, uh, together with a hands-on approach, allowed us to uh, collaborate and to understand each other's uh, strength and then to also uh, work better uh, as a team and also uh, to advance in the industry. Um, if you go to the next one. And that was what I took from MIT. And when I came back to Hong Kong, um, I work as an architect, uh, architectural designer, um, getting towards my license uh, in Hong Kong. Um, I was working at Ronald Liu, um, and it was quite um, it, it it was quite different from what I expected um, as uh, practicing architects. Um, it was a little bit disappointing, um, but at the same time, I learned a lot of uh, administration and also uh, uh, project management, uh, which can be quite unique in Hong Kong because uh, buildings are always being built uh, in a very, very fast pace. And you get a really um, uh, gigantic uh, governments that control a lot of the building regulations and the building codes. So getting that part exposed, I, I mean exposed to that part, uh, I also got the ben benefit from it. Um, but at the time, I was also trying to uh, figure, out, uh, figure out other things that I was uh, interested uh, when I was um, studying my master. So I began to start a small uh, wood shop having my own CNC, uh, some basic uh, equipments and tools for making some projects. And then eventually, if you go to the next one, um, I got into some opportunity for getting uh, recycled timber. That was 2015, uh, six years ago, um, when a building in Chimsacho got teared down and um, a lot of the uh, teak wood, the wood flooring were very precious, uh, but then they were uh, about to go to the landfill. So we got some projects, if we go to the next one. Um, harvesting the uh, recycled timber and then getting another life, um, recycling them, upcycling them, and then uh, contributing in different uh, projects. These projects, if you go to the next one as well, um, are very hands-on. Um, we did the fabrication by ourselves as well, um, using our um, knowledge and also our skills. And next one, combining some um, computation design and also uh, some actual uh, woodworking, uh, be that digital or um, uh, physical ones. Um, and then creating different type of uh, products and projects for different clients. And next one. Um, all, all these were getting me to uh, think about how architecture uh, knowledge can be applied in uh, different scales. If you look at IMS uh, design, they work on 
um, architecture, they work on film, uh, photography, uh, they work on products, a lot of different furniture. Uh, the way of thinking, um, the American thinking and also um, the training uh, got us into looking at how architecture can uh, go into furniture. And this was a Kickstarter project that we did um, five, five years ago. Um, we tried to bring Chinese uh, architecture, um, the way how uh, joy wood joinery are put together, and then advancing it, uh, creating something uh, unique, uh, being a joinery that can change uh, dimensions uh, just by simply rotating it. Um, and then creating a project, uh, launching it in uh, Kickstarter and, and other American platforms. Um, I, I mean, uh, getting um, a concept to be executed uh, in another way, um, rather than the project-based uh, client and designer and fabrication, uh, we become um, the generator of the idea and also the fabrication part. And that got us into uh, creating a lot of other projects because projects become scalable and your ideas and your design can change uh, more people's lives, uh, I would say. And next one, please. And uh, because we are so close to China, I mean, we are part of China, but we are also physically uh, so close we can leverage the uh, manufacturing and also fabrication skills in China. Um, that become part of our journey. And um, I was very interested in looking at different factories process. So that's, be that's why because, uh, we become shifting our scale uh, from architecture design to product design as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, that's the final slide. Sorry. Yeah, so um, what I want to um, talk about is that we, uh, th this is a diagram drew by Eames. Um, there, there, there are different uh, patches and different uh, areas, uh, one representing the interests of you, yourself, the other interests uh, of the clients, and the third is the interests of the uh, society, uh, of the so so uh, of society, I would say. So there may be different things, but when they overlap, that's the things that is most valuable and you should um, take a look of uh, yourself and uh, look deep at what you want to do. And then to find the, the area, the spot that would fit into others and also society's interests. And that would be most valuable for um, anyone to put their energy and resource in. So yeah, that, that, that's, my, that's my part of the sharing. Well, thank you, Dennis. It was really good uh, sharing about your experience, your in uh, studying MIT and also your professional practice as uh, I would say a carpenter. <laughs> yeah, fabricators. Yeah, I really hands-on experience. Um, uh, for those who just recently joined this webinar, um, who would like to have questions for the uh, speakers, feel free to drop your questions from our Q&A chat box. Uh, and we will go over them um, in the Q&A sessions. So uh, please feel free, yep. Okay, so let me introduce to you our third speaker, Joyce Lee Lam. Um, okay, Joyce Lee, would you please? Sure, hi everyone, my name is Joyce Lee, nice to meet you all. Um, so thank you, Hinky, previously for the introduction of me. Um, I actually want to start by building off of that introduction. So a little background information of me, I studied in the Chinese University of um, Hong Kong with a Bachelor of Social Science in Architecture Studies in 2011 to 2013. After that, I worked for a year as a year out in Hong Kong and transitioned to an architecture and engineering management consulting firm in San Francisco after that. Um, it was actually during that year that I had a lot of free time on my hand and I decided to go to the neighboring schools. There were UC Berkeley, there were UCLA or UCSD. And I decided to attend some of the open lectures and open houses there. And I was immediately attracted, attracted by um, some of the presentation they had and the studio culture. For example, I saw on, um, in one of the presentation, there was a model that was completely built of um, coffee grounds. And another thesis that was um, um, studying bee structures. 
So uh, I thought that was in very interesting and that's why I decided to do my per a master's um, here in the US. I did a three-year master's at the University of Pennsylvania, and right now I'm working for um, a, DX, a, a studio called DXA Studio in New York. So today, um, Hinky, if you can go to the next page. Yeah, today I want to touch on a couple of um, topics. First of all, what is the U.S. education like? Um, how do we transition from school to work? What is work like here? And last but not least, um, my biggest takeaways ways from um, these couple of years. So right off the bat, let's talk about school. So I would say um, school is actually pretty similar to um, the ones in Hong Kong. Uh, so we also have around 60 to 80 people per year, 10 to 12 people per class, and there's both studio and electives. For the first year, electives are mandatory, and so um, you don't really get to pick um, your electives. Um, and also for, for the first year, you also can't really pick your professors. It's starting from the second year that you can choose your professors. Um, professors also have their own very, um, in a sense, their own thesis of what a design approach should be. Um, some are very into, say, aesthetics, some are into um, robotics, some are into um, digital fabrication. And so just, just depending on um, which is most in line with your theories or what you believe is in, you get to pick whoever you want. So that um, ties to the third year as well. You also get to do to pick the professor. But the, th the third year is actually the most special out of all three years, because a lot of um, US universities, they tend to invite uh, industry leaders to be the professors. So say um, Penn, we were able to get like Tom Main, Wolf Pricks or um, Marion Weiss. And I'm sure if you ask Dennis and Sue, they probably have other great um, architects um, going to the universities and teach. The third year also has a lot of group work because I think they want to ensure you know how to collaborate with people right before you enter the workforce. And um, both um, similar to Dennis, um, we also have traveling studios for the third year. Um, there are around one or two that still stays in the US, but um, since F Penn is at Philly, they don't occur in Philly. So it, you are either going to Texas or going to the West Coast, but all the other ones, they are populated all around the world. So say um, we have studios that go to Mykonos, there are ones that goes to Turkey or Greece. Um, and for me particularly, uh, I did one of my studio in AA in London because um, I thought it would be a very different experience. I get to collaborate with people over there and I also got to do their courses over there. In schools, there are something that's called certificate. What certificates are is that um, you get to uh, collaborate with other schools within um, Penn, say. So say uh, there's a certificate called real estate. And what you do is basically you collaborate with um, people from Wharton, the business school here, and you together you, you learn about real estate and you also create um, together these uh, really cool business plans. Or say you are into coding, you get to collaborate with uh, people from computer science and you can um, develop apps together, develop softwares together. And if you're successful, you get to launch them too. So looking back, I remember I was really worried whether I can, I will be will, able to fit in into this culture. Um, but I think now that I look back, I think I was overly worried because schools in general are very diverse. People come from everywhere. There are people from Asia, from Europe, from Africa, all the way to like America. And so, um, and another really good thing is right before you start school, there are always these kind of summer intensive course where you have to learn all the softwares preparing you for the studies. So I remember the, these 60 to 80 people from all around the world gathering in this tiny room and we have to learn all these crazy softwares like Grasshopper, ZBrush, um, Maya, and nobody knows nothing. And so um, it was a process where you get to learn with each, with each other, solve problems with each other. And so it's, um, you, you see the best side of people, but you also get to see the worst side. But you also, that's how you find all the amazing friends you have, which um, we get to keep in touch even now. So those are the upsides of um, school, but to every upside, there's also downside too. So for one, uh, I'm in the East Coast, so it's very, very cold here during winter. Uh, it was actually snowing quite a bit this week. Um, so if you are not into that, perhaps you can consider the West Coast. Um, school work is quite tough. I remember back in CUHK, it was already pretty tough. I did not all-nighters, but um, I would say here it's another level. Uh, especially for the first year because of how much software we have to learn. 
we actually, I actually had to pull so many all-nighters, it was like kind of tough, yes. Um, so for tonight, I'm not sure among the audience what kind of stage you are in right now, whether you are um, in your bachelor's or whether you are doing your year out or in master's. I'm sure all of you are very interested in how, we, how did we transition from school to work? Um, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So um, the answer to that is that we actually have three years to prepare for it. So for the first two years, um, uh, if you're not craving to go back to Hong Kong to meet your friends or families, you actually have um, three precious months of summer to uh, do internships. So because Philly was very close to New York, a lot of my friends and even me decided to go to um, New York for internships. And it's also a very common practice for US firms to take back and um, take back the interns that worked with them if they see them as a good fit. So um, basically you have two years to find the firm that really fits you and also two years actually to impress the firms to get you on board as full timers. For the third year, it's very common for um, universities to hold these career fairs, similar to the image you see at the bottom left. So what happens is around 40 to 60 companies will go to this hall. They will send representatives over, set up these booths, and students will um, prepare the portfolio, have them nicely packaged, prepare a resume. And all you need to do is you find the company that you're very interested in, queue in front of them, talk to the representative, present your work, and also ask questions about the firm. So this is a really good time for you to understand the firm. But it's also a very important time because it's the first time that company representatives are assessing you. So if you guys both see each other as a good fit, you can leave your resumes, your portfolio with them, and they will also leave the contact information for you. So um, yes. Um, but um, the for the ways, different ways to transition from school to work, I think the most important one is to establish connections. And the best thing to do that, um, the best thing about it is that you have three years to prepare for it. So during the school year, establish the connections with your professors, establish connections with the jurors that the professors bring along, establish connections with your seniors, and establish connections with um, guest speakers. Because these are the people that can bring you to the job that you want to land on. For example, I have a friend who approached a guest speaker um, right after the the lecture and she was able to land one of her most like a dream job because she was brave enough to approach that person. So for me personally, one of my options um, for work was also given by a juror that attended my presentation. But uh, in the end, I decided to go for a small firm in New York. One reason being I love New York and the other, other reason being um, I want to be in a small firm that gives me a very immersive experience and I'm, so that I can wear as many hats as possible at the beginning. Um, next slide, please. So what is the working culture here? I would say um, in big cities, for example, in San Francisco or in New York, because it's a hub of global talents, people fly all over here to, um, to meet with other talents. So um, people here are very, very diverse. And in our company, for example, since it's a very small company, um, typically it's very transparent. The company really expects you to put on a very personal stake in the company. So um, for example, say there's a design matter on the table, you probably have a more or less equal or equivalent say as a principal, because they really highly encourage you to throw out your ideas to give critiques to that design matter. So it doesn't really matter if you're a junior, in, an intermediate or um, at any stage. In other words, hierarchy is a non issue. Another thing that I wasn't expecting is the work life balance. Um, I Previously, I've worked in Asian countries. Um, I've worked in Japan and I've worked in Hong Kong before, and I know life can be tough as an architect. But here, it's a quite a different story because I think Americans, they really, really value personal time. So weekends is off the topic. And say previously, when I was um, quite overwhelmed with work, it's very common for me to find my manager and together we'll just talk about the work plan and see how to reallocate it properly so that we don't feel too burnt out. They definitely don't want you to be burnt out. Continuous education is something else. Um, they really believe in if the employee grows, 
the company grows with them. So for example, every Friday there's lunch and learn, and they also issue tickets for you to go to events, or um, they have fundings to get you to do research. And in the end, it benefits the company too. Um, next, please. So I've been here studying and working for five years already. And here are my biggest takeaways. For me personally, back when I was in Hong Kong, I was this very timid, very shy person. I never was willing to speak up, but I think I've undergone so much personal growth. I've become very proactive. I see challenges differently and I see risk very differently too. There are an abundance of internship opportunities just because of how big the industry is. And it's very easy to establish these different connections with leaders, with industry leaders. Um, so another thing is, say you are very into industry, um, to, into residential buildings. I understand that in Hong Kong, because of the limited amount of land, you don't really get to um, challenge or experiment with a lot of things. And a lot of times buildings are very efficiency driven. But here, because of how much land there are, um, you get to really experiment um, different kind of building typologies or just challenge them. And another thing is you get to expose to a, a lot of industries. Say um, my friends, actually, a lot of them didn't pursue an architectural career in, um, at the very end. Like some of them are UI UX designers right now and some of them are material scientists right now. In general, I really love my experience and, but it's honestly, it's a very different experience for everyone. So feel free to ask me any questions if you have. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you. This is all three very different sharings uh, from academia point of views, from professional practice point of view, and from, and Joycely, I really admire your working environment and uh, hopefully my employer listened to that <laughs> and maintain <laughs> such a good life balance. I think this is something we're um, kind of missing in the work in Asia, and there's just a, a huge difference work between uh, North America or European country or in Asia. So um, that what makes every place is unique, I think. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for the talks. Yeah. And um, again, if anyone has any questions uh, for the speakers, please uh, feel free to drop us uh, your questions in the chat box. Yeah. Okay. So um, at the second, this end our first part of uh, of a sharing sessions tonight, and the second part I will do it very quickly because um, after hearing all the sharing sessions from our speakers, you might want to know. Uh, you may have already thinking if you want to uh, study abroad, uh, study in US, or you might want to start applying jobs. In, in, in overseas or in the state. So in this sense, uh, I'm gonna give you a very brief introduction about um, corporate accord, corporate accord and the path to uh, US licensures. Um, so um, this is something you might have come across from your professional practice course, but I just, I really want to share this uh, because um, this might be uh, useful for those who are considered to be uh, to become a licensed architect in Hong Kong, um, especially for those who study in US and want to come back and work uh, in Hong Kong, or you study in Hong Kong and you might want to consider to uh, apply graduate school and in the future in the state and uh, work your way up to be a, become a licensed architect in the state. So in Hong Kong, there are three most common paths you can become uh, a licensed architect, and here's the three. Um, usually, um, from HKIA, and then um, and this is probably most the most common way in Hong Kong. And also, there are two more options you can do: is uh, through the NCARP system, which is the National Council of Architecture Registration Board. Um, this is American system, and the ARB, which is the uh, and RIB, which is the British system systems. And through the, uh, I won't go into detail, but in Hong Kong, through the non-local architecture profession, the NLAP, um, you could actually become uh, uh, HKIA members uh, after being assessed by the ARB and the HKIA. So you may find out more information about that, which is a huge advantage. Also um, here, okay, if you want to go through the NCARP, okay, 
Um, it's a very lengthy process, but um, it's totally worth it, I have to say. Um, okay, um, it actually begins from the education. It actually compiles with three different parts, education, experience, and examinations. That's how you become a licensed architect in the state. So um, maybe we can begin with this education. Okay, um, and here's on the right, you can see uh, uh, a, a very briefly roadmap. Um, so basically the education normally take 5.8 years, which including the undergrad school and the grad school. And the AXP, which is the architecture experience program, and usually takes about 4.7 years. And then if you're lucky, the ARE, the architecture registering exam, which takes could be as less as two years. So it's a long process. It takes about statistically from the 2018, um, it would take about 12.7 years in total. But don't don't let this discourage you. Some people did it actually much quicker. Yeah. Mm. So uh, before you begin, you can start um, go to the NCAR website and to establish your NCAR rec uh, record. Uh, through the my NCARP and to begin to uh, you can begin your AXP uh, process uh, as soon as now. Okay. Uh, for the education part, uh, this is something I would like to introduce to you the corporate accord. So if you are study in Hong Kong or overseas, um, so, so the first thing uh, you would need to make sure you actually holding accredited programs to call it uh, to Cabaret Accord that, mm, that how did you find out this information? You can basically log into the website. Okay, basically a Cabaret Accord is the, uh, it was signed back in 2008. Um, actually it's a substantial uh, equivalency between the accreditations, accreditations and validation system in architecture applications. So it was signed between the country, which is list on the left, so it has including Canada, China, Commonwealth Associate of Architects, uh, HKIA, which is highlighted, Hong Kong, okay, and uh, Taipei, Japan, Korea, I believe it's South Korea, um, Mexico, South Africa, and USA. So that means students who receive architecture degree in China, in this country listed, highlighted, including Hong Kong, um, are interchangeable as per corporate accord on architecture education. And you can study in, one can study in any of the accredited architecture program in any of this country and can work their ways to become a licensed architect in any of this country as well. So, um, so which gave uh, you uh, mm, a, a more options uh, to work and study abroad. But however, there's a downside, uh, not, that's not a downside, but something that you might need to uh, aware. Okay, um, a corporate court does not address matter related to professional registrations or licensures. It's just making sure the, the education and credential between the countries uh, whose accreditation validation agency signed a court, okay? And those, okay, have, those individuals will have completed the professional architecture education after 2010. Okay, so anything before that probably need to, um, you might need to find out from our uh, Capra course separately. Yeah. But I'm sure you're fine. You're studying architecture now. So if you're studying in Hong Kong. So um, here's a four university in Hong Kong, which actually are providing accredited programs, which is the U, uh, the HKU, the CU, Zhuhai, and the Chinese, the City University of Hong Kong. And I'll give you a very brief overview. And here's the program, okay, um, that uh, are recognized. Okay, the master architecture. Uh, I won't go into details. Yeah. Here's for Zhuhai and CTU. Okay. Okay, after the education part, after you graduate, okay, after you done, you have your degree. Um, the second part actually would be the architectural experience program, which you can start as soon as while you study, while you're still in school. 
Okay. Um, so what is the AXP? AXP, it's, uh, it's developed and administrated by the, the NCARB, okay, and identifies specific tasks are essential for competence practice. And the program is structured to prepare to practice architecture independently upon initial rec registrations. So how long do you need? How, how long is the AXP? I, uh, according to NCARB, it's actually a document minimum of 3,740 hours, which is under six different six experience uh, areas, which is highlighted at the top right, okay? Each of the area required different hours. So all together, including uh, practice management, project management, programming and analysis, project planning and design, project development and documentation and constructions and validations. Um, all together add up 3,740 hours and actually is separated into two settings. One actually work uh, performed for architectural firm and the other one is setting O, which is experience that can perform outside an architecture firm. So if you want to find out more, you can actually go to ANCORP's website through the AXP guidebook. Um, it has listed specifically tasks for each of the experience area. For example, what you're seeing from the screen, which is related to project management. So, and those are the tasks that you, you those are the checkbox for each of the specific tasks you can, uh, you, you can uh, achieve, yeah and signed by your supervisors, of course, yeah. So for you to prepare AXP, um, things you can start now, which is uh, start to document your hours now, um, find your AXP supervisor, it could be more than one. It could be your, uh, the one from, uh, from your internship program or the one for your summer jobs, you know, um, that make sure you are practice, uh, the, your practice actually fulfill the six different areas, uh, the task were specifically uh, listed. Um, and a set a time frame to report your hours you, uh, to your HP supervisors. You can, you can uh, do it every, um, you can do it by projects, you can do it uh, by weekly, or the maximum actually you could do it is every three months. Okay, so pace yourself, set, uh, set a spe specific time frame to report your hours. Um, and yeah, mm, experience opportunities in the office and outside your workplace. I think outside your workplace is something uh, really interesting. Uh, for example, when you, uh, when you uh, uh, participate on a certain program listed in the, in, in, in the NCARP guidebooks, um, that could be, that. That means that you don't really need to work in the in in the in the office settings in order to earn those credits. Uh, lastly, uh, which is the most challenging part, and a lot of people got picked up here, got caught in here, which is the ARE, the Architects Registration Examinations. Okay, so now which the system has changed from 4.0 to 5.0 which is a good news because now um, you only need to take five exams uh, instead of six. Okay, so what is ARE? ARE, it's, it's, a on, it's, a, it's a test, okay? It's developed by NCARB and it's used by the US jurisdictions as a registration examinations for candidates seeking architectural registrations. So, each of the jurisdictions um, in the state would have a different requirement, but they all require to uh, complete the AR, the, the, the examinations uh, uh, that developed by NCOM. Okay, um, so for people who practice in the East Coast may be a little bit different than the West Coast. Uh, so this you might need to find out more once you register in the NCOM website, okay. Um, but this all exams actually, it concentrates on the professional services that affected the, the public health and safety and welfare. And here's the six, six, uh, six different exams. Okay, sorry, correct. Mm. So there are actually six different divisions in 5.0. And so it's actually related to project management, project uh, practice management, 
programming analysis, project planning design, project development and the documentation and construction evaluations, which is quite similar to the AXB uh, uh, credits you have to earn previously from your work experience. And from the right, this is um, the whole entire exam was done in the multiple choice um, setting. So roughly about like 120 questions each for each divisions. And you have to um, complete it in the uh, four to five hours. It depends on the divisions requirement. Okay, sounds easy, right? It's just multiple choice. But, but actually a lot of people got caught up with the huge amount of information that actually you might need to put in your head. Um, so here's what we could try to help as a YAG Young Architects Group. Um, so in the past, in the 2019, starting from 2019, um, we have upgraded uh, the architect the architecture registration exam materials and it is available for our members uh, in our Hong Kong chapter office. Um, actually it's very handy and very concentrated and focused on the um, on the division each of the divisions you might need to um, focus on and the YAG uh, also providing um, in 2019 we have started uh, with a study group um for our AIA members in Hong Kong um it's a huge success for this this study group was done uh by uh by weekly as frequent as bi-weekly or monthly it's uh apparent on the request if uh some of the members actually are taking the exam schedule the exam um within uh, a month or a week uh it's actually uh, we would we would set up a study group uh, for that. Okay, so I think it's actually quite useful to study as a group, especially where you're in Hong Kong, where the study material is limited and um, and you can fight the battles with uh, with your peers. <laughs> so hopefully we we to provide enough support and resources for the exam takers and be more prepared for ARU. Hopefully you got a big pass, big blue pass. So a very short introduction to YAG. YAG was founded in uh, 2016 and now ever since that we grow up to 30 members and, and we just and we provide entry points for emerging professionals seeking guidance and memberships in pursuing their US licensures. And also um, here's here's some of the events uh, was hosted by uh, a previous president Becky um is to promote uh, the socials and environmental awareness and to allow YG members to give back to societies. So we have uh, we have YG have done a lot of uh, activities and events and volunteer works to try to reach out to the society, to our communities as well. So who are our audience? Um pretty much is um undergrad school, undergraduate students who are seeking for job opportunities or study abroad for um, planning to study abroad for MH in US. Of course, the MH students looking for the career path and young professional who's just recently graduating and getting prepared for AXP credits and licensure exams. So here we are. So, well, thank you. Thank you for uh, this lengthy presentations. I know it's pretty dry, but uh, this is something quite be useful when you're planning your next step for your career path to become a licensed architect. So um, without further ado, um, this is a Q&A time. So um, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to ask our three speakers now. Uh, let me just- There are a couple of questions yeah. in the chat room. You can take a look, maybe. Yeah, well, okay. Maybe we start from the top. Okay. So maybe I start begin with this one. Um, Joyce Lee said that the US master degree education, this is from Joyce Lee. Yes. So, um, so said the US master degree education was tougher than in Hong Kong. In what way did US master degree education be tougher? 
Okay. So um, I can only testify for Penn. Um, mm. And I have never done any masters in Hong Kong before, so I can't really, I don't really know the workload there. But I would say, but the reason why I think it's very tough for me is because when I graduated from my bachelor's in CUHK, the kind of software that I, <clears throat> the kind of software that I pocketed was like um, AutoCAD and SketchUp, and I'm pretty sure it's a very different story right now. I'm pretty sure you guys are very talented and also all kinds of softwares and very prepared. But back then, when I did my first year. I just had to learn so many new softwares, for example, Grasshopper, ZBrush, Maya, um, Coding, Maxwell. It's um, a huge bunch for me. So, and I have to learn that in a very short period of time because in the first year they try to cram so much into you so that in the second to third year, third year these won't be um, barriers for you to actually um, think, uh, think critically about the design. So they have to get away, get this um, all these software issues away first. So that to me, was a quite a heavy workload. I had to spend a lot of time learning those. Um, but once you are more accustomed to those um, softwares, second or third year, you actually had a lot of time to really explore the ideas, to make use of your skill sets and um, work on the presentation and drill into the actual design itself. I would say the first year is the toughest. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. So um, there's a follow up questions about how many subjects do U.S. master degree students need to take in a semester? And is there a work life balance in working in the U.S. as an, archi as an architecture? Um, I guess a lot of people are actually really curious about the work life balance <laughs> thing in, in the States. And, and <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll answer to the second question first. Yeah. So in terms of subject, besides studio, that takes up most of your time. Uh, for the first year, because they want to establish a very solid foundation for you, you still have to do structures, you still have to do construction, professional practice, where you learn about the codes uh, in, in the US, and also, um, what else? History, history of architecture. Um, so that's for the first year. For the second and third year, you get to pick um, whatever electives you're into. Say you want to do the certificate for real estate. Most of your classes are tied to real estate. Um, but for, um, for example, if I'm interested in digital fabrication, I can pick three or four courses that are related to digital fabrication. So I would say um, in besides studio, it would be three to four other courses. Um, first year is the toughest because with history, you have to do a lot of essays. Um, is there work-life balance in working in the US as an architect? Um, yes, <laughs> I would say yes. Um, for example, yesterday I was just talking to my friend and um, she told me she got a day off this week because she has been working till 9.30 every day. And I was like, wow, just 9.30, isn't that like, <laughs> it's not too tough, right? But she got a day off uh, on Monday, this coming Monday. So, so you get the sense of how they really treasure their own personal time. They don't really wanna work too late. Which office is oh, that? Is it? Is it? She still... actually works in shop architects. Oh, <laughs> and they okay. do an amazing job too. Yeah. Um, okay. And but one thing is they also don't pay overtime here. So yeah. Okay. I'm I'm not sure if that's the case in Hong Kong. I th I think so, right? <laughs> no, they they pay by love. Mm, I see. <laughs> love and love. Yeah, yeah, the love of architecture. Um, to add on uh, Josely, uh, I think at MIT and also uh, probably in GSD, um, the, the number of classes uh, are similar. So one studio plus three to four uh, different electives or classes. And uh, for us at, at, at MIT, we can pick more if your supervisor or your um, teacher coordinator allows. Um, so some people would be uh, earning enough credits um, prior to um, others, uh, people's expectation, and they can um, do a semester out or um, do something else um, with the time spend, spending in the school. So there are some flexibility uh, at MIT. Yeah. And also, um, maybe I can offer my stories about the work-life balance um, topic that I think when I first graduated, I I, I really looking to go west because I was I was looking, you know, to live a good life. And later I realized that it was actually a really um, tough office. And everybody worked really hard. But I think, you know, to, you know, talk about work-life balance is, 
I don't think you should really separate them as two really opposites. Um, and for my, at least for me, I, I work when I was working in Michael's, Michael Molson's office, we have a group of friends who are similar age and then we also have really similar interests. And we all, um, actually at work, we actually were very close together and also after work, we also hang out together. So that for me was a really good experience. So it's really, so I really not about, you know, having a, for me, it's not about having a really straight boundary between the work and life. It's really how you really manage to, um, get away from one and really um, enjoy the other one. Yeah. At different moments or different spaces. Yeah. I can see your happy face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So um, I have another questions here um, for Dennis, actually. So it's about MIT. Okay. MIT MA, the architecture study, except it can candidates who didn't have a BA degree in architect studies, what were the difficulties that those students encountered when they participated in their MA, Master of Architecture Study? Um, how did they tackle those difficulties? Um, I don't recall I said that, but um, mm -hmm. just to clarify, uh, MIT uh, offers master in architecture. So I assume it's still the same system uh, as in other um, schools uh, in the US right now, I, I, I hope. So there is this um, degree called the professional degree um, and master of architecture uh, within MIT is a professional degree. And there isn't a BARC, uh, Bachelor of Architecture uh, in, uh, at, no, that there is also Bachelor of Architecture uh, at MIT. In CUHK and uh, Hong Kong U, I don't think um, those undergrads are considered as a uh, Bachelor of Architecture. Um, those are Bachelor of Arts or in Architectural Studies. So if you study in the States and you have uh, completed a Bachelor of Architecture, uh, ERC, you should be uh, qualified as uh, having a professional degree. And you can um, work on your ARE. Is that correct? Am I correct? I think so. Yeah, so um, as, uh, as students graduating from, MI, uh, from, from Hong Kong U going to MIT to study, uh, we are not considered uh, to have a professional degree. And that's why doing the Master of Architecture, which is considered as a professional degree, uh, get us a qualification to get um, ARE later, um, um, later right. yeah, onwards. Um, so uh, it's a different, but um, MIT also accepts students uh, not coming from the architecture background, uh, be that in medicine, business, um, they can join the first year uh, in Master of Architecture in the first year, uh, but some people would just drop off, uh, drop off uh, because uh, it's just too, too harsh for them. Um, and it's quite difficult, uh, competitive to get into um, the class if they offer only 30 um, candidates, but it's possible. And how is that in GSD? I think, um, I think we have a very similar system. It's just, uh, I think the name of the programs or degrees are different across the school. But I think, so the GSD, we call it MR1 and MR2. MR1 is the three year um, professional degrees for those who had a BA in architectural studies, like if you're from HKU or CUHK or, um, you know, CTU or Chuhai, or if you, from a background that's not architecture, say if you study, say, philosophy or engineering in undergrad, you can still apply to, uh, for the MR1 program. Um, if you have a five-year undergraduate uh, degree, which is uh, what Dennis just, just um, introduced, uh, described as a um, professional degree, BR program, you are qualified to enter this MR2 program, which is a two-year program um, for master. So that's called a post-professional um, degree. Yeah. See, um, I have a very interesting question I want to ask. <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of students actually interested about that. Um, 
So how did you apply for GSD and how did you apply for MIT and same questions for Josely? So is there any particular um, requirements or standard you have to achieve before, uh, for those particular programs in, in, in those prestigious school to study architecture? So start from Sue. I missed the, the first part of the question. Oh, okay. The first part of the question was, um, so um, studying GSD and studying MIT and UPenn is a very interesting school and three very different schools. Um, so um, why, why did you choose GSD and how did you apply? And same questions for Dennis and Josely. Yeah. Maybe start with Sue first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually also talk a little bit about that um, in my um, presentation just now, but I, I, I have to be honest, when I first, when I was deciding, I wasn't really that sure. Um, I only find out after I go to those schools. But I think for, if I look back, I think what GSD was um, valuable, the experience was valuable to me is to it opened my eyes to many different things around us as architects. I think because we are in the same building and we, are, we can look at each other's work at all time. And eventually when we go to the, um, the option studio in the last two years, we can, we actually were joined by designers from other disciplines. We have studios that have landscape architects and urban designers with the architects in the same studio. So that's really a valuable experience to not only look at their work from afar, but really actually work next to them and work on the same project. So for me, that was a really good experience. Yeah, so you, you actually get to know how other people work and how appreciate your own work as well. Yeah. Great. Dennis, do you have anything to add on? Well, um, when, when I was doing undergrad, I got the opportunity to do an exchange program uh, from Hong Kong U to MIT uh, when I was uh, having third year. So I saw um, uh, one semester how the master's uh, uh, students would work and uh, present. So that was how I got um, my um, like image of how master's uh, in the States would be taught and and then that's why I applied. Uh, so so probably same as Josely, uh, got uh, having some opportunity to understand what uh, would happen, what will happen in um, different schools and then you try to pick and apply. That would be most suitable for you instead of um, just going after um, um, some, some, some reputation, um, but, but instead the school may not fit you. So I, I would suggest you to go for some open school. Um, they, 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 they open for um, two days, three days, and you can go visit different schools. Um, maybe for the States, it's a little bit harder to go through States, but if you are interested in, um, in it, you should spend some time and um, money to go and visit just to uh, get sufficient information um, for yourself. Yeah, I want to add on to that. Actually, um, even if you go to their websites or like nowadays you use Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, you can actually find a lot of lectures that are held in those schools or you can look at student work in the websites or Instagram. So that's a really good way to understand what that school is about. So um, I would say for the different, like all of these prestigious um, universities, they also have a very different kind of approach to architecture, to design. So for example, for Penn, for SciArc, for... Um, these, um, uh, they really heavily focus uh, more on um, uh, digital fabrication, robotics, whereas some schools are much more theoretical, some are more um, um, focus more on the profession, uh, the more practical stuff. So I think it's a very important thing to know exactly um, what you're more interested in, because by picking whichever school you want to go to, it actually um, shapes what kind of um, education you're receiving. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, for the next questions, um, okay, how much structural engineering knowledge do the architecture student need to have if they aim to be registered architects in US or in Hong Kong? I guess structure is always the weakest part for every architect. <laughs> As, I mean, the most challenging part. Um, I can't speak for, um, 
register in Hong Kong, how much of knowledge of structural engineer might need. Maybe Dennis could help you out with that. But for uh, the ARE exam, um, the six divisions, even though it's the six divisions, but they are pretty much overlapped in many of the subjects. So for example, uh, the PDD, uh, the project development, um, we call it PDD, uh, that division actually was mainly focused on uh, structurals. Uh, and so you pretty much need to know your, uh, your moment diagrams. You need to, you need to different, be able to differentiate the, the shear diagrams and the moment diagrams. And you, but you don't really need to calculate those, but you, you pretty much need to understand the principle of it. Uh, that's how I, that's how I, did my, how I studied it, and um, and the ARE exam, they're not trying to pinpoint uh, that uh, the, that depth of information you, you you need to study, but pretty much stick to the basic, the principle, the principle of it. So um, I'm sure you could look for, you can join a lot of our ARE uh, discuss forum that you might find out a lot of uh, questions and answers there. And give you a little bit broad overviews and also the mock exam, uh, which is also available online. Uh, the black spectacles are pretty much a good source to look for and just practice and practice. Um, just knowing the principle, you can basically know everything. Yeah. So um, Dennis? To, yeah, to, to add on that, um, when I was doing bachelor in Hong Kong U, I, I, I was also um, into quite into structural uh, classes, but then uh, th those classes are quite different from uh, those that I had at, at MIT. MIT ones, we had to do the calculations, um, sizing members, doing calculation for bridges, understanding the tension cables, everything. Um, so it's more, uh, uh, may maybe it, it's the same for other sc US schools, but at least you uh, will understand how to uh, differentiate um, as, uh, uh, as said, and also to have some calculations. For MIT ones, uh, they might be a little bit more in depth. Uh, so when I got the license uh, at, at Hong Kong, uh, in Hong Kong for HAIA, uh, it was very easy for me, uh, the structure exams uh, for HAIA. I am sure for AIA ones, it's also about the principle. So if you have uh, education in the States, probably you wouldn't find it too difficult. I think, that, yeah, one thing to add on to that, the ARE exam is to just try to test your knowledge on um, health and safety and, and your ADA. The, the ADA requirement, which is the disabled requirement um, in, in the state, it's, it's a big thing. Accessibility, yeah, it's a big thing. So you, you have to pretty much know um, the, the dimensions, the width and the, the, the slope, yeah. So um, yeah, so pretty much, yeah, I mean, even there's a lot of information to including exam, but um, you you will find all the right sources, yeah, from 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 a lot of uh, 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 materials, yeah. Okay, so there's another question. Wow, Dennis, also to Dennis, how did the MIT students present their work in architecture student as uh, architecture studio classes, and how did they impress you? Well, um, the the culture for MIT was that all the student presentations were happening at the corridors. Um, so outside the, the classrooms, I would say, outside the studios. So there are always a lot of um, presentations happening um, along the corridors. And those spaces become uh, spaces for knowledge exchange. And even if you are not at that year or not in that class or not in that, uh, department, you would be able to, when, when you are traveling between classes, you will be able to see others, uh, people's in, uh, presentation on the boards, on the walls. So that was one of the culture and um, for students, well, they just present, um, I, I would say much more models and uh, prototypes and one-to-one -one scale uh, prototypes uh, I found in 
in, in at MIT more than uh, at Hong Kong Union. Mm, impressive. Well, it, it's just different topics. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, all the topics are always impressive. Actually, uh, when when I check out Hong Kong U or CUHK's uh, graduation uh, degree shows, uh, I always find Hong Kong topics uh, more more interesting. But um, well, people. Uh, students in MIT, they solve uh, global climate and uh, sea level changes. And I, I, I think those are also discussed here. So I don't think they are quite different anyways, in terms of topics. Right. Uh, Sue or Joyce Lee, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I agree with Dennis, because I also go to MIT a lot to um, visit my friends there. I think the, the space of all these schools uh, really affects how they perform and how students um, perform and learn and have knowledge exchange in the schools. At the GSD, um, if you just Google the image of GSD, you see all these terraces um, um, that are sectionally stacked in the, um, in the building. And that's how we, that's the space, the studio space we work. That's how we, you know, if you are in the studio above, you can look down and see the work below in another studio, which is probably not an architecture studio, probably a planning studio or a landscape studio. And that, you know, that simultaneity, um, simultaneity in the same room is also really um, helpful. And then we always have reviews and presentations in different spaces also um, across the, the whole building. You know, there are some in, more formals in the, in the, in the stadium, uh, in, in the presentation room, or there are some less formal ones in the uh, seminar rooms around this, or in the, or just on top of these, um, uh, the, the, the terraces and in the studio space. That's how I think um, be able to be in the same building and it, almost in the same big room with all these different people at the same time, that really help to develop a sense of um, education. I totally agree with the two um, speakers. It's the same at Penn. Um, basically, on the ground floor, you have the big space for exhibitions and presentations. And we're on the second floor, and you, they're all glass. Um, yeah, and so you look down and you see all the presentations down there. So it's a very um, visual and direct interaction with like all the work that is exhibited. Yeah. Great, thank you. So we have 10 more minutes. Maybe we just go over two more questions. Okay, uh, I have one for Joyce Lee. Um, <laughs> you have worked in a lot of uh, big names architects before, like Eisenman and Shigeru Bang Architects. So uh, as an intern, so how did you find work there? And maybe you can tell us a little bit what working, you were you saying it was intensive uh, in Japan and compared with where you work now in the state. So maybe you can, Tell us a little bit, or maybe tell the students a little bit. How did you apply for those uh, internships? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, um, in my first year, uh, in my first summer, I interned at Chigaru Ban. Um, he's really good at. Um, he does this all um, amazing paper tube structures, and he built a lot of disaster relief projects. And in my second summer, I went to Eisenman Architects and. Um, he's a guru in the academia, so it's actually very two different. Um, experiences. And the reason why I decided to go for these two extremely different experiences is because um, to me, I think um, these two summers are very precious. It's right before I'm going to, um, before actually entering the workforce. And so I really want to see what kind of um, companies I'm into, what interests do I have, what kind of, um, yeah, how should I pay, um, shape or pave my career path? And so I decided to choose v these very differing companies just to see how it works. Um, um, so for the work experience there, I would say Shigeru, in Shigeru Ban, we do, because we're just um, as interns, we have to work heavily on hands-on models. Um, and um, sometimes we do stay up a, a quite late. And a lot of times, um, Shigeru Ban is very structured. So you know exactly what you're doing that very day. And you have to report to um, a senior or, um, yeah, it's just way more structured. At Isamin, it's, uh, we only have four people in the office. So it's uh, very, very, very small. Uh, we worked on a book that was recently published called Lateness. And um, 
Peter was very open. He was um, very willing to teach um, me and another intern. So that was a whole different experience. Um, for um, In terms of advice, I would say to everyone here, um, do not be afraid to apply because you never know where you will end up being. I've never thought of going to these um, firms at, at all. So uh, for whatever firm that you're interested in, your dream job, whatever, just apply. And another thing I would definitely say is cater your portfolio to those firms. Instead of having one very generic portfolio um, where you just submit it to a hundred firms, actually study those companies that you like. What are the design philosophies? How do they present the work? And try to cater all your work towards them. And especially for internships, because of how quickly people actually go through the portfolio, make sure you present your ideas very clearly, make sure the presentation is visually striking, because a lot of times they just flip through the portfolio and pick the person they want. That's all. That's a very interesting point there, because a lot of students actually might be afraid of applying mm -hmm. to the celebrity architects because, um, they, they don't know how, or they might not, they don't know, they're not sure if they will end up getting a, an internship there. So mm -hmm. I think this is a really good advice of seeing you work from there before and a successful case. Yeah. Um, so, so, but you don't speak a work of Japanese, right? Do you? When you work Sorry? for Figure it. Did you speak for uh, any Japanese? No, no, no. It's not required. <laughs> I don't know any Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I, th I think yeah. a lot of students might be find it difficult to apply for internship in Japan because heard that maybe you might need to know the languages or maybe the language barrier might hesitate them, yeah. No, no, I think a lot of people um, go there because um, a lot of international people because of how great the architecture there is. So a lot of um, the employees are very willing to speak English with you as well. So the language is definitely not a barrier. I think Great. if you go to Tango Kuma, Shigaru Ban, and um, Atalia Bawang, all those they speak uh, pretty good uh, English. And um, there are international teams within. So uh, basically, you just speak English to your supervisor or your, um, your team. Right. Uh... Okay, one last question. Okay, uh, this one's for Dennis. Okay, um, so you have starting your own business now, your own practice uh, studio, right? And what makes you start your own practice? And, and what would be the greatest challenge? Because a lot of students might consider they end up being a licensed architect and then open their own practice at the end. So maybe you can, you can give a give them some advice and what are the challenges you faced when you're running your own studios and, and how did you overcome that? I think one of the biggest uh, challenges to decide when to start your own uh, practice uh, or whether you should start your own practice. Um, when, when I was trying to start my own practice, that was uh, four, four years ago, five, um, my parents were very against uh, my decision uh, because uh, just because professional always need experience and um, my experience is just limited uh, as, a, as an architect in Hong Kong. Um, people would think uh, working more and more would be beneficial to your own practice. But for my case, uh, it's a little bit different because uh, what I want to do is more uh, an exploration. It's more hands-on. Um, I, I can't learn anything about um, doing a CNC work or a, um, a, an, an algorithm uh, to solve something uh, at a corporate firm in Hong Kong. Uh, maybe a small firm, I can learn that. But even for a small firm, um, how can you define or decide how long is appropriate? Um, if you are working in a small firm. And so the, the question become uh, whether you are confident in setting your own um, direction and then charting your own um, uh, pathway um, when you try to start your own, own firm. Um, I, I would call myself a small studio because um, we are designing uh, not just for, 
within the architecture scale, uh, but also interior and furniture. And I saw that uh, uh, that there, there is a limitation for project-based um, things, projects, because uh, what you do is only um, applicable within that time period. Um, maybe the building uh, is amazing. You can serve all the visitors coming to your building, but you can't serve um, people that are, uh, just don't have the opportunity to come visit. So that's why I try to look into products where products can be disseminated and exponentially grow, uh, depending on how your marketing is done and how your uh, network um, of distribution can be done. Uh, so, so that is an interesting thing that I uh, kind of deviated from uh, traditional uh, mortar-based uh, architecture. And that's why I need to come out and uh, start my own. So would you find a difference whether if you work from stay, work from a, work at a stay instead of work in Hong Kong? Is that the environment actually that different? Like you... Uh, do you mean uh, when I was scattering my uh, experience before getting licensed, or do you mean uh, so, uh, What I mean is right run to run your own practice. Like, would there be difference in state and rather than in Hong Kong? I'm I'm not sure. When when I was doing uh, my master, we had a class called the professional practice and. Uh, the professional practice basically taught you how to, or, or discuss the possibility of how to do a startup. Uh, mm -hmm. Talking about budgeting, uh, getting clients, positioning your firm, that was an interesting class. I'm not sure what would be um, in reality if I really start a firm in, uh, in the States. I would say if I'm not a local resident, maybe there are some, some something more difficult, uh, I think in Hong Kong, uh, you get a lot of opportunities depending on how you want to position your uh, company, your, your studio. If you want to work on interior, there are a lot of opportunities. Even for architecture, you can start from uh, the small ones. Uh, you can work on facade only, um, and then you can gradually uh, work on um, houses or, or, or small buildings, like single tower buildings. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of different types of collaborations. Uh, you can be the design architect. Um, another uh, consultancy can become uh, the AP, um, handling all the submission and also um, the bureaucratic works. Uh, but of course, you have to understand how the game is being played in Hong Kong uh, before getting um, a foot into the the, uh, the industry. Um, so I would recommend everyone to um, get more experience. Uh, go and try out bigger firms and smaller firms, boutique firms and uh, corporate and understand what you want to do and see the overall picture before um, really getting uh, a start on your own. Okay, our time is pretty much up. And any last advice for students? Any uh, in a sentence? Shu Chen? I, I agree what Dennis just, uh, just, just said. I think, you, I think being a student is the time where you have the most freedom. So you, I think you should try as many different things as possible, different things in school. And also I, I like what you just said, like try different kinds of offices before you actually choose your career path. I think that's really important for me as well. Yeah. Joyce Lee? I totally agree. I think do not be afraid to try. Do not be afraid to accept risks or accept different challenges. Only by trying all of these do you know like what you actually want in, in career and in life and everything. This is yeah. This is this. This is a very exciting evening, and having three successful architects, designers here to sharing their uh, careers, uh, how uh, on the career path story on the career path, and I'm fine. Uh, I my personally find it very inspiring and very encouraging. Um, I'm I'm hopefully everyone um, are staying with us uh, would find that too. Um, 
Thank you, Su Chen. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Joyce Lee. And Joyce Lee, I can see the, the sunrise from your Yeah, own. it's getting brighter. It's <laughs> Thank you for staying up early. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Thank you so much. Um, um, if there's any other questions for the speakers, feel free to um okay, we can't go we, we can't go through every questions today uh, because of time, but you can feel free to drop your questions in the chat box and we will get back to you and Hopefully, the speaker will get back to you as soon uh, as well. And also, um, one last thing, the YAG is offering, uh, is preparing the mentorship programs uh, in the very short, um, in the short, very short coming time. So please stay tuned. And for those who are interested about the mentorship programs, um, this is it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Su Chen. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Joyce Lee. Thank Hopefully you. we can have another sessions because um, this is a very big topic and we can possibly to go over them one by one, but this could be a start. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.